people will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own souls. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Carl Jung everybody. Today we are going to cover a topic that I've had some requests for, and with my own fascinations on the topic, I'm happy to do so. We are going to talk about Carl Gustav Jung. Now, trying to break this down into uh, ASMR documentary is a little challenging because because Jung covers a lot of important topics very deeply and a lot of his own text is very dense. So at this point I think I'm going to break this into three separate sections or videos. Um, this section is going to be uh, essentially a biography for Carl Jung. And then we will also talk about um, some of his groundbreaking theories, uh, breaking down the archetypes that he has laid out. And then I would also like to touch on his red book. We'll get into more details about that later if you are aware of it. But for now, let's talk about Carl Jung. Carl Gustav Jung, sometimes known as C.G. Jung, was born July 26, 1875 in Switzerland. In a quick blurb, he was a Swiss psychologist, psychiatrist, who founded analytical psychology in some aspects a response to Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis. Jung proposed and developed the concepts of the extroverted and the introverted personalities, the archetypes and the collective unconscious. His work has been influential in psychiatry and in the study of religion, literature, and related fields. Jung was the only son of a Protestant clergyman. Oh. He was a solitary, quiet, but very observant child who displayed loneliness through his single child status. But maybe because of that isolation, he spent hours observing the roles and paradigms of the adults around him, something that no doubt shaped his career later on in his work. Yes, he felt his childhood was lonely, but he enriched it himself through his imagination. From an early age, he observed the behavior of his parents and teachers, which he tried to resolve. In his autobiography, he described various secret rituals by means of which he kept contact with his childhood inner world and shielded it from others. When first attending school, he found that in trying to adapt to his rural companions, he often alienated him from himself as sensitive and imaginative people often do when trying too hard to fit in. Jung stated, There is no better means of intensifying the treasured feeling of individuality 
than the possession of a secret which the individual is pledged to guard. He was especially worried with his father, Paul, after his previously strong religious beliefs began to degrade. Carl tried to convey to him his own experience with God. Paul Hume was a decent man in many ways, but as father and son relationships often go, the two had difficulty understanding one another. Carl seemed destined to become a minister as his father, as there were a number of clergymen on both sides of his family. In his teens, he discovered philosophy and read up a great deal on topics. This, together with the feelings of solitude from his boyhood, led him to decouple from the strong family tradition and study medicine. He grew up and went to primary school near Basel. He then attended the University of Basel. There he was exposed to numerous fields of study, including biology, paleontology, religion, and archaeology. After experimentation, he finally decided to focus on medicine. He was a, he was a student at the University of Basel from 1895 until the turn of the century in 1900. Then he attended the University of Zurich. And while attending the University of Zurich, Hume worked on the staff at Berkholzi Asylum, where he was mentored by Eugene Bleuler, a pioneering psychologist who laid the groundwork for what's now considered classical studies of mental illness. At Berkholzi, Hume began to apply association tests initiated by earlier researchers, which is the general psychological principle linked with the phenomena of recollection or memory. He studied mainly patients' peculiar and illogical responses to stimulus words, found that they were caused by emotional charge, clusters of associations withheld from consciousness because of their embarrassing, disagreeable, immoral, and often sexual content. He used the now famous term complex to describe such conditions. It was also around that time in 1896 that Carl met a 17 year old, Emma Rauschenbach, the daughter of a wealthy industrialist. They fell in love, and although you did not come from money and he was virtually penniless at the time, as a student and then assistant physician, Emma's parents encouraged a marriage. They wanted their daughter to be happy. She would bring plenty of money to the union and finance union's work for years to come. They married in 1906 and eventually had five children, four girls and one boy. The nature of union's process in the early days of psychoanalysis were rife with a blurring of personal life and professional theory. And at this time in the fledgling discipline, plenty of first-hand experience made it into theoretical texts. Analysts interpreted not only their own dreams, but those of their nearest and dearest. It wasn't easy on friends and family, and, and affairs between analysts and Allisons were not uncommon, and enamored with her own cures, analysts frequently went on to train as analysts in their own right. Emma herself went on to become a psychoanalyst. Yoon's blossoming reputation as a psychologist and his work dealing with the subconscious eventually led him to the ideas of Sigmund Freud. What he had been finding in his own research had essentially tied his work to Freud's investigations, and his findings confirmed many of Freud's ideas. In 1907, Jung published a pioneering book on schizophrenia, 
called The Psychology of Dementia Precov, which he sent to Freud. It was well received by Freud, and between 1907 and 1912, he was Freud's close collaborator. He held important positions in the psychoanalytic movement and was widely thought of as the most likely successor to the founder of psychoanalysis, a term describing Freud's own school of thought just established in 1896. But this was not the outcome of their friendship. Diverging viewpoints and temperament ended their collaboration and eventually their friendship. Famously and publicly, Jung challenged Freud's beliefs about sexuality as a foundation of neurosis. He also disagreed with Freud's methods, asserting that the Elder psychologist's work was too one-sided. Sarah's disagreement came in 1912 with the publication of Jung's Psychology of the Unconscious, which ran counter to many of Freud's ideas. But breaking with Freud had consequences for Jung. Freud closed off his inner circles to the young psychologist and Others in the psychoanalytic community also shunned him. Although Yun had been elected president of the International Psychoanalytic Society in 1912, he resigned from the society altogether in 1914. It hit home as well, as Emma Jung and Freud had developed a close bond. Emma often seeking the Viennese doctor's advice when it came to the problems with her and Carl's in relationship. She viewed him as a surrogate father figure who was now estranged. Seeking to further distinguish his work from Freud's, Jung adopted the term analytical psychology and redoubled his efforts in the work. One of his first breakthroughs was to differentiate two classes of people according to attitude types, extroverted, or outward-looking, and introverted, or inward-looking. Later, he distinguished four separate functions of the mind, thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition, one or more of which predominate in any given person. Results of this study were laid out in the book Psychological Types in 1921. Jung's broad expertise was well personified here, as it also had been in the book The Psychology of the Unconscious. During this period, he also allowed himself to explore his own mind, eventually proposing the idea that there was not only a personal unconscious, but also a collective unconsciousness, from which certain universal symbols and patterns have arisen throughout history. At the heart of analytical psychology is the interplay of these with the ego, a process he labeled individuation, by which a person develops into his or her own true self. Now, as a boy, Jung had vivid dreams and powerful fantasies that had developed with intensity. After his break with Freud, in an attempt to further define his analytical psychology, he allowed this aspect of himself to function again and gave the rational side of his nature free expression. At the same time, he studied it scientifically by keeping detailed notes of his strange experiences. A lot of these are captured in the Red Book. Again, we'll cover later. He later developed the theory that these experiences came from an area of the mind that he called the collective unconscious, which he theorized was shared by everyone. This conception was highly contested, but he didn't push forward and combined it with the theory of archetypes that he held fundamental to the study of psychology of in Jung's terms, archetypes are instinctive patterns 
they have a universal character and are expressed in behavior and in images. A term, archetype, means original pattern in ancient Greek. You developed this concept of archetype in his theory of human psyche. He identified that 12 universal mythic characters' archetypes reside within our collective unconscious. Each of us tends to have one dominant archetype that guides our personality. The ruler, the creator, or artist, the sage, the innocent, the explorer, the rebel, the hero, the wizard, the jester, the everyman lover, and the caregiver, each of which is seeking something else in four different carnal orientations. The ego, leaving your mark on the world. The order, providing structure to the world. The social, connecting to others. Freedom, yearning for paradise. Again, just touching on these. We'll delve deeper into the archetypes in the next video. Yoon devoted the rest of his life to developing his ideas, especially those on the relationship between psychology and religion. In his view, obscure and often neglected texts of writers in the past shed unexpected light not only on Newton's own dreams and fantasies, but also on those of his patients. He thought it necessary for the successful practice of their art that psychotherapists become familiar with writings of the old masters. Besides the development of the new psychotherapeutic methods that derived from his own experience and theories developed from them, you can give fresh importance to the so-called hermetic tradition. Hermeticism is, uh, generally speaking, a collection of the occult concepts and ideas and philosophy set forth in the writings of the hermeticists in the late Middle Ages and the early Renaissance. It's a label used to designate a philosophical system that is primarily based on the purported teachings of Hermes Trismegistus, a legendary Hellenistic combination of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth. These teachings are contained in the various writings attributed to Hermes. Hume conceived that the Christian religion was part of a historic process necessary for the development of consciousness. He also thought that the heretical movement, starting with Gnosticism and ending in alchemy, were manifestations of unconscious archetypal elements not adequately expressed in the mainstream forms of Christianity. He was particularly impressed with his findings that alchemical-like symbols could be found frequently in modern dreams and fantasies, and he thought that alchemists had constructed a kind of textbook of the collective unconscious. He, he further fleshed that out in four out of the 18 volumes that make up his collected works. His Historical studies aided him in pioneering the psychotherapy of the middle-aged and elderly, especially those who felt their lives had lost meaning. He helped them to appreciate the place of their lives in the sequence of history. Most of these patients had lost their religious beliefs. Ewan found that they could discover their own myth as expressed in dream and imagination. They become more 
complete personalities. He called this process individuation. finding one's true self. Throughout all these career milestones, Emma was by his side. The structure of their relationship is all too familiar. The genius husband who strays. The wife who graciously holds the home together. Brings up the children. Plays hostess putting her own ambitions on hold. Carl did stray and had several affairs, two in particular with former patients turned analysts. Sabina Spielerain and Tony Wolf. The relationship with Wolf was tolerated by Emma for 30 years. There was a brazen menage a trois, not only personally, but professionally, with all three analysts actually passing patients back and forth from one to another. In his later years, he became professor of psychology at the Federal Polytechnical University in Zurich. That was from 1933 to 1941. Professor of Medical Psychology at the University of Basel, 1943. His personal experience, his continued psychotherapeutic practice, and his wide knowledge of history placed him in a unique position to comment on current events. As early as 1918, he had begun to think that Germany held a special position in Europe. The Nazi revolution was therefore highly significant for him, and he delivered a number of hotly contested views that led to him being branded a Nazi sympathizer. The Nazi talking points and some anti-Semitic writings do muddy the waters of Jung's memory and legacy. Unlike Nietzsche, whose work was deliberately bastardized by Nazis, you need not be taken out of context to be read as anti-Semitic. There was no irony at work in his 1934 paper, The State of Psychotherapy Today, which he marveled at the National Socialism Movement as a formidable phenomenon. And he writes that the Aryan unconscious has a higher potential than the Jewish. That is objectionably anti-Semitic. But there are defenders. One defender admits in an essay collection called Lingering Shadows that Yoon had been unconsciously infected by Nazi ideas. In response, psychologist John Conger said, why not then say that he was unconsciously infected by anti-Semitic ideas as well. Well before the Nazis came to power, he had expressed such thoughts as far back as 1918. Like the philosopher Martin Heidegger, Jung was accused of trading on his professional associations during the 30s to maintain status, and turning on his Jewish colleagues while they were purged. Yet his biographer, Deidre Bear, claims Yoon's name was used to endorse persecution without his consent. Bear also reveals that Yoon was involved in two plots to oust Hitler, essentially by having a leading physician declare the Fuhrer mad. Both came to nothing. Whether or not that's true, we don't know. But Ewan was livid with the situation. Mark Vernon of The Guardian wrote, not least because he was actually fighting to keep 
German psychotherapy open to Jewish individuals. And unlike Heidegger, Jun strongly denounced anti-Semitic views during the war. He protected Jewish analysts, writes Conger, and helped refugees. He also worked for the OSS, the precursor to the CIA during the war. As I said, it's muddied the water. We don't have a clear picture. Yoon lived to the age of 85. The famed psychologist was beset by heart and circulatory troubles and began to fail several weeks prior to the death. On June 6, 1961, he died. The next day, on June 7, the New York Times read, Dr. Carl G. Jung is dead at 85, pioneer in analytic psychology. At 85, Dr. Jung seemed to have no trouble in living life to the full. His home at Kusnak was a handsome villa with yellow walls and a red roof. He maintained a private retreat farther up Lake Lucerne, near Bonnegan. This retreat was an old stone tower, which provided him with a place to rest, meditate, and write. In 1903, Dr. Yoon married Emma Rauschenbach, of Schaffhausen, Switzerland, heiress to a Swiss watch fortune. When Madame Jung became seriously ill, she asked for a family friend, Miss Ruth Bailey, an Englishwoman, to take care of her husband in the event of her death. Madame Jung died in 1955, and Dr. Jung's material needs had been looked after by Miss Bailey since then. Persons passing Dr. Yun's villa on lake boats frequently saw him sitting on the lawn, perhaps watching his great-grandchildren at play. Dr. Yun is survived by a son and four daughters. He had 19 grandchildren and nine great-grandchildren as of last year. Over the door of his Kusna home is carved the Latin inscription. called, or not called, God is present. That's just a little bit of the story of C.G. Carl Jung. As I said, we'll be breaking this down into a couple additional videos. I want to dive deeper into some of his theories and concepts in the next one. If you're still with me, leave a comment. Let me know what you think. As always, thank you for listening. Please give us a like and a subscribe. We'll see you in the study later.